Uh, I want to kick off a new series, new uh, series of, of messages and, and, and preaching for the next several weeks. Um, and the, the, the title of the series is Same God. We just sang a song entitled Same God. And here's the premise of what we're going to be talking about. It's expanding our faith on the faithfulness of God. There's one thing that I'm learning, especially as I go to a different country. Uh, us Americans, we are strong in several things, but I just want to say we're not as strong in our faith as I believe God wants us to be. We're dependent on a whole bunch of other things, and I want to just draw your attention to the God and the miracles of God throughout Scripture and how He has been consistent through the ages. And it's time for us to elevate our faith, elevate our expectancy to the level and the nature of who our God really is. This is the God that raises people from the dead. This is the God that opens up blind eyes. This is the God that shuts the mouth of lions. This is the God that makes the walls of Jericho fall down. This this is the God that slays the giants. This is the God that calms the storm. We serve the God of forever. And so I am uh, supercharged to say the least to commission you uh, to expand, to expand, to expand our faith. Let's go to Psalm 106 today. Psalm 106. I want to uh, start uh, this series and uh, approach uh, something that God had, had showed me over the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to preach a very famous story through Scripture. Uh, this is the parting of the Red Sea, but I'm not going to necessarily start with the text that we are familiar with. You see, the parting of the Red Sea uh, is not just a historical event that, that God did. It's a, something that actually, even to this day, many people remember the faithfulness of God then for the challenges that they are facing today. And we're going to remember there's a God that's making a way through the immovable of what you're facing as your enemy behind you is pressing. And when you look ahead, you said, I don't know where to go. I don't know how to move forward. I feel stuck. I want to preach today to some people who feel stuck. Psalm 106, starting in verse 7. When our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. When was the last time you gave some thought to the miracles of God? They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, to make his mighty power known. He rebuked the sea and dried it up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. I wonder how many are stuck in this room today. You are stuck by what's chasing you from your past. And when you look forward to what is ahead, you say there's no way to go and you've lost your song. You've lost your praise. You come into a house like this and it's even hard for you to use your voice, not to sing songs to sound good, but to use your voice to make a joyful noise, not to the neighbor to the left of you or to the right of you, but to make a joyful noise to our King, to our Savior, to pour out our very best praise at His feet, to lift up His name. But have we forgot? Have we forgot the power of God? Have we forgot the miracles of God? And have we dumbed God down to a Google search? I want to speak today from the title, if you're taking notes, Moving Forward in Faith. Moving Forward in Faith. If I had a subtitle, if I was preaching this maybe to some youth and young adults, here would be the title, Honk Honk, It's Time to Move. Honk Honk. It's time to move. So God, we thank you. We thank you for what you have in store today. We thank you that as your word goes forth, we know your word says it will not return void, but it will produce much more than what is sown. So we declare that your word is falling on the good soil of our hearts and it will produce much fruit in our life and we will be changed and different in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for the stuck ones today for the ones who are frozen in emotion, who are stuck in feelings, 
who feel like a diagnosis from a doctor is the final say. Father, we move forward in faith. We hear the honk of heaven today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said a great big amen. amen. So as we, we uh, opened up with a little bit, my, my, my family, we got to travel. Uh, we were blessed by an amazing family, and uh, we got to spend some time uh, in Africa, the country of Kenya. Uh, and beautiful people in Kenya, by the way. Like, America will say we're one nation under God. Kenya is a nation under God. Uh, the people love the Lord there. The churches are packed on a Sunday. Uh, the way that they treat and love one another is a beautiful thing. And uh, we had a great time. One of the things I was not ready for was um, uh, being in a car in another country. <laughs> I, I'm used to speed limits. I, I'm, I'm used to order as we drive on the road. Um, I'm used to people using a crosswalk to cross the street. Driving, which I did not do in Kenya, um, but we were being driven, um, was one of the most stressful things of my life. You, it is utter chaos. Not only are you on the opposite side of the street, but you are driving really on a two-lane road that is most of the roads are unfinished. They're not paved like many of ours are. And it is utter chaos. You have horns going off left and right. You have people walking throughout the roads as they will. You have people trying to get around the car in front of them by changing lanes, by going on into the lane of the oncoming traffic to get in front of other people. Now, I, I started to notice something um, as, as we were there, like, like honking is different in their culture. Like, like the first time that, that, that there was somebody in front of us and the light had turned green and, and, and the driver started to, to honk the horn, my first emotions were, oh, I better be ready to fight. I better be ready to protect my family. Because in America, when somebody lays on their horn, it's immediately followed by a finger, some road rage, so this is what I'm, I'm preconceived to believe, right? But in Kenya, it just could mean so many different things. It could mean, hey, there's a simple reminder that the light is ready. It could be a simple reminder like, hey, it's great to see you. It could be a reminder like there's somebody coming on the other side of traffic. I know you're getting ready to cross. It could be a gentle reminder for those who are walking about the streets. And what I felt from God today is it's time to tune our ear to hear the gentle honk of God. Not, not your American preconceived notion of a honk like God's ready and he's upset and he's trying to fight you. That's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve is a God of a gentle honk who does not want you to stay in the same place that you are. He wants you to know that you can move forward in freedom. This, come on. I know y'all talk back. So as we approach the Red Sea, I want to just draw your attention to, to, to a couple things. As we read through the Red Sea, the Red, the, the Red Sea is used as a reminder throughout Scripture and throughout history to remind ourselves of the faithfulness of of God. The Apostle Paul would talk much about this. He would talk as the Red Sea represents and, and could be a foreshadow of the waters of baptism, dying of who we once were and coming through the waters, a new creation. Because you see, you have to understand at this point in history, the, 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 the nation of God, the Israelites, the people of God were about a week out of slavery. They spent 400 years in slavery and all they knew, what they were accustomed to believe generationally, what they were accustomed to believe was a life of slavery. And so now they're approaching and they're on the journey of freedom. And as we look to the Red Sea, I believe it's even in Acts 7. And I believe it's, it was Stephen who got up and in, as he's preaching, he led people to the reminder of the power of God and the faithfulness of God that made a way through the sea. You see, today I want to remind you that though what you're looking at may seem insurmountable, it may seem immovable, it may seem like you lost your job unexpectedly, it may seem like your lost child, there's no hope for them, it may seem like you are faced with a diagnosis, your psychiatrist, your counselor may have given you a diagnosis and you're saying, well, that must be what it is. 
We're going to stay stuck here. And I want you to know today that you can move forward in freedom. So if you were to ask me, what does the Red Sea represent? It represents this, that God is committed to you being free. He is committed to you being free. God didn't just save us so that we would stay the same version of ourselves. Stuck in our addictions, stuck in our negative ways of thinking, stuck in the same old perspective of life. God throughout scripture is committed to you and I being free. Why? Because he who the son sets free is free indeed. He wants his people to walk in freedom. So I know there may be some people that, tell, that have told you, well, this is just what it is for your life. You're stuck. Let the voice of God, the honk of God today, remind you that he will move a sea for you to be free. Let the voice of God remind you, the honk of God remind you that he will shut the mouths of lions so that you can go forward in freedom. Let me remind you that he'll put the fourth man in the fiery furnace that will protect you and that man is Jesus. So he's committed to you being free. The second thing that we can learn from the Red Sea is that God is going to get his glory. God is going to get his glory. That, 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 that is one thing we are for sure of, whether we jump in and we get behind what God is doing, he's not dependent upon you, God will get his glory. And this is good news for you and I. The Red Sea reminds us that God and God alone is to be worshipped. So the 400 years of generational slavery, the 400 years of only knowing the same way of doing things, for 400 years of feeling entrapped, God says, no, my glory is for my people that they may go free and worship me in spirit and in truth. Okay, y'all doing well? So Psalm 106 is a, Interesting text. I read this last week and I find the, the, the language of Psalm 106 as an interesting account of the parting of the Red Sea. It is a reflection. It is a reminder of what God did years earlier, written to a people who were coming out of captivity. It is a place if you can imagine to the ones who feel stuck today, you have an enemy pressing you from behind so you can't go back. And when you look forward, you say there's no way. And you have made camp at a place that God is telling you to move from, to move forward from. So he says when our ancestors were in Egypt, think about this, hear this, to, to the ones who feel stuck. They gave no thought to your miracles, which when we, do, when we feel stuck, what happens? We start to diminish and dumb God down to our current realities. It says they did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea. Now, I find it fascinating. Like I, I'm familiar with the scripture about the Israelites rebelling like in the wilderness. Like, like after they get through the Red Sea, the, 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 there's the, the whole manna issue, you remember that? Why, why do we have to eat this manna again, God? Can't we go back to the leeks and the garlic and the onions of our slavery? We're tired of eating in our freedom. We would rather go back and be slaves and eat the food of our slavery. You remember those, right? You remember the, the cries and the complaints. And so I, I remember them rebelling in the wilderness. But Psalm 106 does something very interesting. And it shows us that they actually rebelled at the Red Sea. Because I've always taken the Red Sea parting as a great move of faith. I mean, we sing songs about the faithfulness of God, the God who made a way when there was no way. Through the faith of the saints, God moved mightily. But Psalm 106 actually talks about the rebellion of the people as they're on the journey of crossing the Red Sea. Now, I want you to be clear today here from Pastor that yes, the Red Sea is about faith. Hebrews 11:29 it says, by faith, 
the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. So, so Psalm, he doesn't mention the rebellions that we typically know about. But can we go back? Can we, can we go back to the comfortable ways of what was? And it's fascinating. As Psalm 106 verse 7 draws our attention to their rebellion, understanding that they've been now free for about a week. And they would have just seen God send plagues that he would protect his people from that he would use that to tell Pharaoh, it's time to let God's people go. They just seen God move in a mighty way about a week ago. Here we are on a journey, the rebellion, forgetting the power and the mercies and the kindness of God as recent as a week ago. So Pharaoh he started to realize about a week into it what he lost. He realized that I know God said to let those people go and we ended up letting those people go, but I want those people back. And so now he sends out his greatest army, his best chariots, and now they are pursuing the very thing he just let go, he's realizing the value in what they lost. And I want to remind you today that there is typically a great attack on the verge of breakthrough. There is typically a great battle on the verge of you moving forward in faith. And you're frustrated in this house today because you're saying, why does it seem so strong? And you're ready to give up and go back. But God says, listen, it's time, honk, honk, to move forward. Amen. They did not remember your many kindnesses and they rebelled by the sea the Red Sea. So I, I read this and I had to go back and read Exodus 13 and 14 because I, I was like, I, I don't necessarily remember seeing that because every time that I read Exodus 13 and 14, it's through the lens and the eyes of faith. So let's go back and read Exodus 13 and 14 a little bit. Is that okay? Amen. If it's not too bad, you can't have too much Bible in a message. It's the word of God. Amen. Nothing I will say will change your life as much as the written and spoken word of God, okay? So, so let's, let me just give you a couple of verses in Exodus 13 because I, I found this fascinating. It says when, uh, in verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though it was shorter. And some of you are frustrated right now because you're saying, God, there was a faster way to go through this journey. So God allowed them to go the longer way because there was something deeper that God was working on. And I just want to suggest for your imagination today, he wasn't just working on their physical freedom as he was on their spiritual and internal freedom. So he allowed them to go the long way for God said, if they face war, they might change their mind and return to Egypt. If they face a challenge, they will want to go back to what was comfortable and known over the last 400 years. Is this not indicative of you and I? Because I'm telling you, even in moments that I feel strong, when there's war and there's great trial, and struggle, oh, I'm ready to go back and eat some leeks and garlics and onions as well. You are too. I think if we were to be honest in the house of God today, uh, we prioritize something that God never prioritized, and that's comfort. So struggle to the individual that feels stuck, and you, you find yourself in this struggle. The struggle is testing the contents of your heart. I'll prove it to you. We keep reading. Here's the point. Let me make this point. Only God knows when you're really ready. Yeah. Only God knows when you're really ready. You, you can fool others. Newsflash, you can't fool God. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. 
And then this next sentence jumped out to me. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. They left slavery and captivity, what the scripture says, is ready for battle, or so they thought. Okay, you understand the picture of what's going on, right? There's an immovable sea. We're weak into freedom. And now our enemy is pursuing behind us. So we left camp ready for war, or so we thought. Now war is coming, and guess what? We're not really ready for it. Because God knows when you're really ready. You're not going to fool God. I mean, they had the garb on. They were dressed. They, they, they posted on their Instagrams like they were ready to flex for battle. Are we ready? We saw it. And then war came. And they weren't ready like they thought they were ready. It's interesting how a lot of times we will do this in life. We will try to convince God that we're ready for something that he knows we're not. It's like, are you, are you really ready? So many Americans would pray, God, would you give me more money, more resource, more influence? Are you really ready? Are you really ready for all the responsibility that comes with that? Are, are, are you really ready for that promotion? Are you really ready for the things that you're praying for? And I just want to say that maybe some of the things that we're praying to God for, we aren't really ready for. And could we just get to a place to say, God, remove from me any thinking, any thoughts of my captivity that I'm even fooling myself. So many people, 13 years full-time of vocational ministry have seen this time and time again. People will say they're ready for something. And then God tests the contents of their character and their heart and it reveals, you ain't really ready. But it takes humility to come to grips with saying, you know what? I was wrong. I'm not really ready. I remember about 24 years old when God really started to download and impress upon my heart this region leading church, preaching the gospel, reaching a city with the good news of Jesus. I remember coming to church on Sunday, sitting in, in seats like you're sitting in, watching the pastor, watching what was done and being like, God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready. God knew I wasn't really ready at 24. <laughs> so then he took me on a journey to go through some stuff. Some stuff that, 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 that is really hard to even share. Why? Because he was cleansing me of some things that I could not take on the journey ahead. And so he allowed me to go what seemed like the longer way because he was working on something deeper on the inside of me. So don't be so frustrated with God because things aren't happening on your timetable or when you think you are ready. God is preparing something on the inside of you that will sustain what he wants to do in and through you. That's really better than we're clapping for. <laughs> so he sent the Egyptians. He allowed the Egyptians to pursue him to test if they're really ready. Oh, you're dressed ready? You got all the swag and all the stuff that shows it. Oh, you. Let's see if you're really ready. So let's turn over to Exodus 14. Now we get to the point. Where they are in dire need of a move of God. They realize that um, maybe the outfit for war that I put on, I had no idea what I was doing. I haven't really been in a war like this. The Egyptians would usually fight for us. We would just take care of their needs. So verse 10, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, the Israelites looked up. And as they looked up, there were Egyptians marching after them. And some of you, that's right where you're at. You look up, and every time that you look up, you see things of your past marching after you. You see the enemy of your soul marching after you. And it says they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They were terrified and cried 
out to the Lord. Terror could be a good thing if it leads you to crying out to the Lord. It wasn't until they experienced terror that they cried out to the Lord. Now, the Egyptians represent their past. It represents for them captivity. It also represents all that they know. It represents comfort. It represents food. It represents shelter. Now what they used to depend on is chasing them to enslave them again. You find yourself there? Like I know you told yourself in college you were going to get over that thing. Like you, you were going to give it up. But now you find yourself at 45 and that thing of your past is still haunting you. That thing of your past has still got you trapped. It's what I know. It's comfortable. I thought I'd be over this. So you have an enemy pressing behind, and as you look forward, you feel like there is no way forward. There's a C. Because this is the diagnosis that I got from my psychiatrist. This is the news that I'm faced with. This is the reality of my situation. And that's where we are, I believe. And, I, and whether this is for three people today, I'm totally okay with that. To the three people who feel chased from your past and you're looking forward at an immovable sea. By the way, Contrary to popular belief, the Bible is not just a history book. Oh, the Bible uses history, but the reason it uses history is to teach us proper theology. So, so we can read scripture, it's why it's alive and it's active. Because it shows the consistency and the character and the nature of God. It's not just a recount of the things of old. No, it speaks of and it shares stories of the faithfulness of God throughout the ages. It is not just a history book. This history formulates our theology, how we see God and how we see the world. So these people find themselves at this spot. We were, we were ready for our freedom. We were ready for the promised land. We, we were ready for that land flowing with milk and honey. We, we were ready, dressed for battle, to go the short route. And some of you, that's what you feel, because God had spoke something to you in your 20s. And now you're in your 60s and you're saying, ah! should I keep on marching or should I just make my bed? There was no swimming classes. There were no boats readily available there. There wasn't like a ship, like everybody hop on. There was a sea. And it was a very, very deep sea. Go and do some research on it. It's massive. So the question I have for you, what is standing between you and freedom? What is standing between you and the freedom that God desires you to have? Is it the thinking of 400 years of captivity? Is it generational stuff? When my mommy and my daddy were always this way, they thought this way, I must just stay here stuck? Is it a faulty self-view? Would you begin to really see yourself in the way that God sees you? But I can't because I'm, I'm used to what was and what's comfortable. So what is standing between you and freedom? Can I tell you one of the passages that, that keeps messing me up in our, in our popular culture that we live in right now? And, and, and by the way, if, if you struggle with, with, with things, welcome to the We all do. Okay, good. There better be. Like, church isn't perfect. You know why? Because you're here. <laughs> we, 
But you remember when Jesus healed that lame man? And he told him, pick up your mat and walk. This is going to be a harsh to some of you because a lot of the, the coaching that we get enables us to stay stuck. Pick up your mat and walk. Start moving forward in freedom on the faithfulness of God. You can be free. So they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? They wanted to throw the car in reverse. They started to blame. They started to shift responsibility. They wanted to return to what wasn't working because what wasn't working was comfortable. <laughs> they wanted to serve these masters forever rather than to go to war and see the glory of God be revealed. Thank you. <laughs> but what's fascinating about this text, because again, I've always read this as a text of great faith. Before they had great faith, they had some fear. You know what I did when I read this? I found this relatable. Because even the most holy of holy people, the ones who will spend hours upon hours of time, when they're really faced with something, we would be lying to ourselves and God to say, there's not an ounce of fear in me right now. And this is freeing for some of you. Because you're beating yourself up. Because you find yourself struggling with the fear of something. And even as they had fear of what might be, the faithfulness of God did not change. So sometimes, guess what? Your character does not change the character of God. This is good news. And then they said this line that I, I found interesting. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. I, so I, I had to do some research. Because when I went back and read about this when they were in captivity, they never said that. They never said that. Like, if you do your research and you find that in the Bible, please send that to me this week. I couldn't find it. Why? Because fear of the future will cause you to romanticize the past. <laughs> did, did, wasn't, it, wasn't it that much better back then? Did, remember all those things I said? You didn't say that, bro. And somehow in our pathological lion minds, we've convinced ourselves that back in slavery and captivity was so good. You didn't say that. The fear of the challenge today is getting you to romanticize 2019. Ugh, that one hurt. America, it's time to move forward. It's time to move forward in faith. The faithfulness of God does not change. We can't stay romanticized in the past and the way things was in our comfortable vacations and our easy life. We must move forward in faith on the faithfulness of God. Oh. So then Moses answered the people. Now, the statement we're about to read is a statement so full of faith. But I put myself at times in Moses' shoes and considering all the things he'd done, even in the recent week, I'm like, man, that dude was a little crazy. <laughs> or he had an encounter with God. Or he had an encounter with God. Or God really spoke to him. So Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. 
stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. He will bring it to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. But they're coming, Lord. They're getting closer. And at this point, I hear the chariot wheels spinning. I hear the roars of an army. At this point, I'm looking out at a sea that hasn't done anything. And I can't swim. And then Moses said this. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Exodus 14, 14, very famous passage of scripture. We quote this all the time, don't we? I do. And I'm, and I'm glad that he does. But where I think we've erred is we've read Exodus 14 without reading Exodus 14, 15. So, so, so some of you are stuck. Like, let me say this. Some of you think that God has given you a red light, but the light's actually green. And you say things as you're stopped at a green light. I'm just being still and the Lord's going to fight for me. God, God you, you, you keep doing the battle. I'm sorry, Swifty. Contrary to popular opinion, Jesus take the wheels wrong. He's not going to do for you what you can do. You can grab the wheel and you can drive. God does the miraculous. You do the obedience, practical thing, and watch what God does. So, so to the individuals who's been stuck for 10 years, because you keep saying, I'm just, I'm just being still. This is a season just to be still. The, Lord, the Lord's going to fight for me. And you're using that verse out of context to enable your laziness. Because the very next passage that Moses will speak to the people is actually a conversation that he has with God. And now God replies to Moses. And to the individual who's saying, well, by the way, God, let me, let me pray this real quick. God, I, <laughs> do not let the words be misconstrued. God, because a lot of times, even personally, I like to take the easy way out and call it God. But you're, you are far less interested in my comfort than you are of rebuilding me, refining me, strengthening me in the Lord. So God, help us to not call a green light red and a red light green. Give us eyes to see and to perceive the truth of your word in Jesus' name. So now to the individual whose favorite verse is Exodus 14, 14, and you still are 30-something years old, you're living home with mom and dad. I got quiet, sorry. God's going to fight for me. No, you can get a job. But I, but I can't because I've had this thing and then I've had that thing. No, you can move forward. Watch what, 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 what God says to Moses. And by the way, the, the, the be still and know that I am God wasn't a command to the practical being. It was a command to the fearful state of their soul and spirit. Be still, my soul. The Lord God will fight for me. So then the Lord said to Moses, verse 15, why are you crying out to me? You're still having the prayer meeting. What? I told you already. What did he tell them? Tell the Israelites. Tell the individuals who feel stuck, who feel the enemy of their past, the enemy of their soul, the enemy, all that comfort coming and pressing behind them and a sea right in front of them in the state of fear and the unknown that they find themselves in, tell the Israelites, tell Lighthouse Church, Kevin, to move on. That's the command. Well, where do we go? Where do we go from here? 
how, here, here's something very practical. How do I move forward? Because if you're like me, I, I, I've got some grandiose visions from God. We'll write down some plans that I feel like he's downloaded to me. And if we're not careful, we can try to hop, skip, and jump. And yet, how do you move forward? One step at a time. One step at a time. Left foot, then a right foot. And if you got two left foots, left foot, left foot. <laughs> One step at a time. So, so as I ask the, the worship team to come up, and we're going to sing again about the faithfulness of God. I want you to hear the honk of God today. Beep, beep. Move on. Move forward. Move forward in faith. You can't stay in your excuses and be who you were years ago. You can change. You can become who God's intended for you to be. You don't have to make camp in the valley that you are in. Let me say it this way. The miracle is not in your feelings, it's in your feet. Because these boots are made for walking, and that's just what they'll... And these boots are shod with the gospel of peace. Whew. It's time to start walking again. It's time to move forward. It's time to not have our life bound by our feelings. You, you know, Psalm 23 says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So God has intended for you and I to walk. The verse did not say, though I camp in the valley of death. I walk. I got a green light. Somebody needs to know today, you have a green light in the valley. Oh, God's used the valley to refine you. Now, you, you, you have allowed the lies of the world culture and the enemy and the people around you to say, I might as well just set up a tent here. And God says, I've never intended you to camp where I've instructed you to walk. Step by step it's time to move on and to start walking again and god is so good and god is so sovereign why because what else does he do he makes me lie down in green pastures he makes me lie down so god revealed to me where i need to lay to rest where I need to start walking again. So when our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. Don't let bad theology tell you to dumb God down. Come on, let's give thought to the miracles of God this week. They did not remember your many kindnesses. God's a kind God. You may not hear this type of preach in many places, but he's so kind. He's not furrow-browed. He's not angry at you. He's kind. He's gentle. He's loving. Oh, the wrath of God is a real thing, but he put it on his one and only son. He's a kind God. They didn't remember the many kindnesses. So what did they do when they gave no thought to the miracles? And they forgot about the kindness of God. They rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. When you forget who God is and what he has done, you rebel. Because rebellion to God and the lie of the enemy that leads you to that rebellion seems easier, seems more comfortable. I want you to know today that 
to the individual that's been rebelling, even you can stand up and start walking again. Notice how good God is. He says, yet, yet for his name's sake, to make his mighty power known, even in their rebellion, the kindness and the goodness of God is displayed. So he's giving you a gentle honk. It's time to move on. The light's green. I've taken you the long way and I'm taking you through the sea because I need to remove some arrogance from you. I need to remove some idols from you. I need to wash away some of the thinking of your past. I need to remove some of the insecurities. I, I, I need to break the addiction off of your life. Anytime that there is rebellion to God, there's always a rebuke. And in this case, there was a rebuke. And I want you to know how loving and good God is. Because in verse 9 of Psalm 106, he rebuked the sea. And it dried up. And it led them through the depths of the desert. They rebelled against God. And God rebuked the sea. Not the people so that his people could go through on dry ground. And as they go through on dry ground, as the last Israelite brings up the end of the march, the waters start caving in behind them and their enemies start drowning. The things of their past, the comfort 400 years of thinking this specific way. I once a slave, I'm always a slave. And by the way, I find it interesting that they never audibly referred to themselves as slaves. They said, we were slaves. The devil will do this. He will take a situation and a struggle in your life and he will ascribe an identity to it. This is why I just got it. Got to be careful in, in, in our world of diagnosis because we're so quick to diagnose and give labels to everything. And as we diagnose and give labels to it, we become overwhelmed with the label and we take that label as our identity. And we start making camp at a place that God said it's time to move on. You can be free. You can walk forward and move forward in faith. There is a honk from heaven to get you walking again, to build and elevate and expand our faith on the faithfulness of God, not even in our rebellion, not even in our shortcomings, not even in all the things that we did wrong, not even in the moments of our fear. The faithfulness of God does not change. And somebody needs to know today you can go forward and you can go through on dry ground the spirit of God is with you listen he gave Moses a staff we've got a greater staff and that's the spirit of the living God that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and my Bible says greater is he who lives in me than he that is in the world so I'm telling you through the spirit of God you have what it takes to move forward on dry ground by the faithfulness of God. I would stand to your feet throughout this room. I would start to pour out some worship to Jesus. I would start to hear the honk of heaven. I would start to pour out your worship. Can we begin to lift our voice? Can we sing about the faithfulness of God? That you heard your children then. Oh, you hear your children now. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same
for for years as you step one day at a time and start to move forward you will see the evidence of God oh Jesus we love you I want to just close and speak to that person in rebellion I want to speak to that individual who's far from God who came to church today feeling like God's mad at you he's upset with you that he doesn't love you that you've done too many things and he must have put a curse on you no 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 that's not the gospel the good news of the gospel is he put that curse on Christ Jesus when he went to the cross so that you and I could be set free so that you and I can be forgiven so that you and I could be made right so pastor what will I do what must I do the Bible says when you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart you repent of your ways and you confess this Jesus Christ as the one and only Son of God you will be saved you will be forgiven oh there's a rebuke but he put the rebuke on Jesus so you can walk forward into the destiny that he has for you so with every head bowed and I close I'm gonna say a prayer today if you're in this room and you are not right with God you are not following Jesus I want to give you this opportunity to respond in faith to the good news of the gospel of Christ Jesus, that God made him who knew no sin to become our sin so that you and I could be the righteousness of God. Let's say this together. Let's say, God, thank you for loving me with a steadfast and stubborn love. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And so I confess and I believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only resurrected Son of God. And today I place my faith in Him and I'll never be the same again. In Jesus name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Come on, if you made that decision today, do me a favor, shoot your hand up throughout this room. We wanna celebrate with you. We wanna celebrate with heaven. The Bible says God bless you over here somewhere they're pointing. God sees you, he knows. You grateful you came to church today? Are you grateful for the faithfulness of God? Tice, you can come up and close out the service. Here's what I'm committed to this week, every day. One step at a time. Who's with me? One step at a time. Come on. What a great word. 